It's Friday, 11th of May, 2018, and you're listening to Amusing Ourselves to Death. Hi, Cam. Hi. How are you? I'm not so bad, thank you. How are you? Not bad. What have we got to be happy about this week so far? <laughs> well, we've released a couple of good videos that you should definitely go and check out. One of those was with Dr. Clear Bourne talking about the techniques that are used in the financial PR industry to distort the kind of information that comes out. Yeah, I thought that was great. And I thought it was interesting also the way in which that she was able to very easily talk about the relevance of Facebook and Goldman Sachs in the same interview. Mm -hmm. I got a lot out of that uh, interview. Yeah, I strongly recommend people to watch that one. It's very relevant to many different subjects, such as technology and marketing mm -hmm. and banking. What else did we get done? We released the first episode of Hot Off the Press, which we're doing in collaboration with DSmog which gives you all the big environmental news of the last few weeks or the last month, and which should really be what's taking up the spaces on the front pages. Yeah, I remember Matt from Dsmog told me that they are investigative journalists mm -hmm. who specialize in the climate field, and they are the only people who take seriously the promise that politicians made that they would make sure that global temperatures don't rise above two degrees. So that's why we call it the third degree. <laughs> he, he, he. Okay, there's a lot that we're going to talk about today, mm. and I hope that we don't miss anything out. So what's the first thing that you want to talk about? Yeah, well, there's a lot to say about this subject. We're going to talk a little bit about legal aid and the legal aid cuts that have been taking place. So what happens to the public when legal aid and legal support is ripped away from people? Now, remember, legal aid is not... Uh, it's not like some kind of handout. It's not some kind of kickback. It's something that was used to ensure that the mores of society and the basic rules of justice and democracy can be followed. This isn't some kind of benefit, right, to, your, to the poor and the marginalized. But there's been a huge amount of legal aid cuts, and that's also happened under austerity. And we we'll, might be able to unpack the results of, of, of that kind of timing. The reason this is kind of relevant at the moment is because there's currently a review happening by David Lid Lid Liddington. Oh, yeah, he he's is... quite close to Theresa May, isn't he? He's one of her real allies. Yeah, he's he's been MP for Aylesbury for, since 1992, um, and he's undertaking a review into legal aid cuts and the LASPO Act, which is Legal Aid, Sentencing and Punishment of Offenders Act, which was brought in in 2013. Now, this was a review that they'd promised before, um, so they're finally undertaking it. And what the LASPO Act did, it basically brought in lots of new means testing and lots of new rules for people who could be eligible for legal aid. Okay, so just to, just to double check that I'm following you right here, mm -hmm. legal aid is help for people who can't afford a lawyer. Yes. So people on low incomes who can't afford a lawyer but need a lawyer. Therefore, something has happened which has gone wrong and they need a lawyer. Yes. And you're saying that that is now being means tested. Yes. So this is when people say legal aid cuts, does this, are you saying that all of this stuff means people are not allowed to access justice? The doors of acts of justice are closed. That's exactly what this is about. So the government has said that the reason that they're bringing in all this stuff is to ensure that the right people and the most needy are getting this help. I spoke to a, a barrister, Mike Gould, a few years ago, and he said that when legal aid was first brought in, it 50% of the population was actually eligible because the whole premise behind it was to ensure that everybody had access to justice. Now, the legal aid bill has been cut in the last few years by about a billion pounds. And I think it was only about two billion in the first place. So those are really, really drastic cuts. And the way that they've done that is through introducing these new rules, this new means testing, which essentially serves the purpose of kicking people off the eligibility. Okay. Uh, well, that's uh, definitely answering my question. Mm. And sadly, it looks like, yeah, I understand what you're saying. So shall I give you some of these statistics? Yes, please, uh, about what's been happening. Yeah. So... There's been a report this week from the government. You can go to benefits and work and find some of the breakdowns in terms of the different kinds of benefits that have been affected. Um, but there was a report, the government tried to sneak this out last year in one of their reports. So there's been 
in 2011 and between 2011 and 2012, there was 83,000 legal aid cases that were benefit related. By 2016, 2017, do you want to give me a guess by how much that was cut by? Okay, so it was 83,000 in 2011 mm-hmm. in that one year. Mm-hmm. And then 2017, 83,000. 83,000. Okay, uh, 20,000? Lower. 10,000? Lower. 5,000? Much lower. 1,000? Lower. The actual figure is 440 cases. 83,000 to 440 cases. Yeah. So 83,000 people were eligible and used legal aid, and then 440 people used legal aid. Yeah. So that's a collapse of 99.5% of the people who were taking forward cases in 2011 um, who weren't taking them forward in 2016, 17. And bear in mind, obviously, between that time, you've had huge welfare reforms, huge benefit cuts, arguably giving people more reason to have cases. I saw, I, Again, Mike Gould, what he said to me that has always stuck with me is that this was a two-pronged attack by the government. So at the same time as they're cutting people's resources and they're cutting the public Austerity. services, yeah. they're cutting people's ability to challenge those cuts. So this, you know, there's no way that you couldn't predict that this is what was going to happen. Yeah, we know, I mean, I, I know somebody that we've spoken about, Emma Friedman, who is the Valparais campaigner. Mm-hmm. And she said that even though it's proven that her son is disabled as a result of the medication that she took when she was pregnant, she can't take it to court because of cuts in legal aid. Wow. So the doors of justice. In France, victims of the same uh, drug, they have been able to go to court and get justice. Mm-hmm. And in America as well. I think the cases in France are still ongoing, but at least they're able to take them to court yeah. against the um, pharmaceutical firm. And we can see kind of similarities with this happening in terms of welfare. So the, most of those cuts obviously happened with disability living allowance and employment support allowance. Bear in mind that disabled people have been some of the most affected by austerity. So they are nine times more affected than the average person, paid nine times more essentially, than the average person for that financial crisis. And they are then mostly affected by these legal aid cuts. And at the same time, I mean, you said that the legal aid cuts protected this corporation. What have we had happen during Hold on, you're talking about, so are you suggesting that a lot of the people who were disabled, whatever it is that made them disabled, sometimes they might have a case against that, Mm -hmm. and that these cases are basically going to be forgotten about? Because that's what's happened with Emma. I th- what I'm trying to say is that during austerity, we've had a huge amount of corporations marching into welfare services. Companies like ATOS, who has been replaced by Maximus, who uh, disabled people against cuts, have been fighting for a long, long time, who are then driven by a profit incentive. You know, kicking them off the disability living allowance is now a bonus for ATOS. So they're working, we talked about targets. These are corporations who work off targets. They've turned our welfare services into profit incentive systems. And there are clearly going to be, there have been uh, abuses of this kind of system and people have been wrongfully kicked off. And now they don't have the avenues despite facing a more aggressive system because there's a company that profits out of doing it. Okay. So we've got, we've gone from legal aid cuts to talking about people who are having their benefits cut because of tests that are run by corporations. Mm -hmm. And so that means that some of them may have cases against corporations for whatever issue, and they will not be able to go ahead because of the legal aid cuts. Yeah. Okay. So some of the, it's not just uh, people who are on benefits who are affected by the kinds of reforms that we've seen. Domestic violence victims, the government said that they were definitely still allowed to access legal aid. But because of the evidence that is now required from domestic violence victims, uh, a report by Rights of Women, who did a some research on this, found that 40% of domestic violence victims could not access legal aid because they could not provide the evidence that was now required. Could you... So that means if they can't provide the evidence that that's required to get the legal aid, does that mean that they don't know how 
to provide the evidence because the evidence is there, right? They're victims. Mm -hmm. So why can't they provide the evidence? What's, what do you think this is about? Well, I think obviously it's been made more difficult. You're asking domestic violence victims to prove you're a domestic violence victim. And how do you do that? Do you need a document? Do you need to show them the bruises on your arm? Do you need to show that you've contacted the police before? I, you know, I, yeah, don't, I, I don't, don't know, know what the process is, but I suppose it's some kind of almost forensic thing where you might need some advice and some legal expertise. Is this what we're talking about here? That's the They can't get legal aid because they don't have the legal expertise to be able to provide the proof that is necessary to meet the bar in order to get the legal aid. Is exactly. it something like that? that something like I that. hate to have an imagination that works like this, but it feels like that might be what we're talking about. Yeah. As, there's some parallels we could draw with the Windrush example because they destroyed their documents and then said, prove that you've been here for 50 years. And, you, and you know, it's almost impossible for them to do that. And of course, when you're dealing with domestic violence, those sorts of evidence you know what 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 is what is going to qualify for that what what i find funny obviously i know different people in society of different sort of backgrounds and when i've spoken to older tories then they quite firmly believe that this kind of thing that's happening if it's happening that it's unintentional and that it's not fair to say that people that vote Tory are racist, vindictive, classist, ageist, this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And I genuinely think that the people that are telling me this really mean it. I don't think that they, I mean, when you talk to me about this example mm -hmm. of what I would call a loop, yeah, I mean, this thing where you're not allowed to have legal aid to help you in the case of domestic violence because you're not able to provide the proof because you don't know how to provide the proof mm -hmm. because you lack the expertise. That's a loop. It's a kind of self-defeating, self-reinforcing loop. That means mm -hmm. no one will ever be able to qualify yeah. and no one will ever be able to get justice. Of course, people will be pushed off. Yeah. And now if you don't go through that, it's difficult to imagine that that might be the case because you just, you just want to believe. I mean, if five years ago the legal aid was there, or shall we say 10 years ago, mm -hmm. if it was there then, then most people would assume it was there. And then when it's gone, no one thinks about what that means Yeah. until we hear these figures. I never thought about this until I heard these figures. I mean, I did have some idea of it, but not much. The, I mean, barristers have been talking about it. They have been warning about it. But, you know, we've also had, during austerity, and we've talked about this before, and I used to do a lot of stuff to do with welfare. And the reason that I did that was because the narrative in the mainstream press was following this poverty porn line, which essentially meant that people who were on benefits were made to feel like they were getting a, too much of a handout and also that they were to be disbelieved. You know what you were saying about barristers? Mm -hmm. Could you tell me a little bit more about that? You said barristers have been talking about that. So I know that that was one of the things that you wanted to talk about today. Yeah. So I mentioned Mike Gould. That was, a, that was in 2015, I think I spoke to him. But there's been a series of historic strikes that law, law, um, lawyers have been undertaking against legal aid cuts. Why is that? Is that because they... Explain. Because of their conditions, essentially. Now, there's a campaign, and it started under New Labour, really, to talk about fat cat lawyers, and that kind of narrative has been used a lot. But it is not criminal lawyers who are making loads of money, right? The the idea of those fat cat lawyers are the guys who work for these corporations, right? Who are paid to... Corporate lawyers. Yeah, who are paid to delay cases or to somehow subvert justice through other means of... Well, you could say look after their clients, by the way. But yeah, <laughs> but yeah sure. okay. But what's happened with criminal lawyers is that they haven't had a, a pay rise in line with inflation since 1998, uh, 1999. And that has resulted in a 34% reduction in real terms. And now the LASPO Act, Legal Aid, Sentencing and uh, Punishment of Offenders Act, that brought in another 10% cut on top of that. And there was no research by the government into the sustainability of that kind of cut on the market. Yeah, I'm not sure who the Justice Minister was. I know Ken Clark was Justice Minister for a bit at the beginning of the coalition. Mm -hmm. And I know that... Um, Michael Gove had it at some point too, but I don't know who, it might have been Chris Grayling. I can't remember who yeah. the justice 
minister was, it could well have been Chris Grayling. That sounds yeah. like him, doesn't it? Yeah, that kind of stuff. basically. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Stop them from reading and everything like that in prison. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, you mentioned domestic violence. You mentioned the issue of barristers. You were also going to talk about one or two other things in relation to the legal aid. Yeah. Uh, well, if you, there's a good report on the Law Society. Uh, you can go and read that. Where is it? What, what is it? it? It's on their site. It's called Access Denied. Thank you. And they did this last year. And in that, they explained that this was literally ripping away this support because on March, 20, uh, March 31st, 2013, people who were eligible for legal aid a day later found that they weren't. So that's how quickly this system came into effect. Now, in the last week, we've had a report by BuzzFeed. Emily Dugan did a really, really great piece, a really, really great piece. And she finally got her hands on a report that the Ministry of Justice was trying to hide, which involved interviewing judges about their experiences of the cases that they're now handling where people are representing themselves. Judges are... I don't understand what you mean. Okay. So as a result of these legal aid cuts, yeah. people can't afford lawyers. Okay. So what are they going to do? They're going to have to represent themselves. Okay. So there's been a stream of uh, people who have no idea how law works. They okay. have no idea what is strong evidence. But they're in court. They have no idea what, what in the documents that they have is going to be meaningful okay. in a courtroom. And they are being forced to represent themselves. Right. Now, some of the comments that the judges have made, uh, one of them was that I've seen plenty of people who look like a rabbit in headlights. Um, it's delayed cases. There's proof that this is delayed cases. But what, because the what judge happens? Can't... What is Emily Dugan saying? Emily Dugan is saying that the judge is there, the um, person who has a case against them is there. Mm -hmm. They have to defend themselves, they have to provide evidence, and they have to. But then normally they have a lawyer. Yeah. And so, what were you saying about the judge? Basically, this is definitely going to lead to miscarriages of justice. But what did you say about the judge? You were saying the judge is doing something in these cases. Judge is doing... Oh, right. So there's this one example where a woman was accusing an ex-partner of raping her and abusing her son. And she and him could not afford lawyers, so they were both representing themselves, and the judge had to perform the task of cross-examining the witnesses on both sides. Because... What are you meant to do in that situation? And he even said, I think the outcome would have been different if they had received legal advice. Right. So in terms of whether or not an innocent person goes to jail or yeah. whether somebody gets off scot-free having been an abusive um, stepfather and husband, mm -hmm. that outcome would have been completely different if there hadn't been legal aid cuts. Yeah. And the judge themselves is saying it. Yeah. Hmm, it's total chaos, essentially, what's happening in the courts at the moment. Yeah, okay. The, is, by the way, there is a, a strike happening at the moment by uh, criminal lawyers who are refusing to work because of the fees that they've been paid. Bear in mind, new barristers are on, some of them are on about £12,000 a year. That's not even minimum wage, but they're not entitled to that because they are described as self-employed. Um, so they're not doing this about making loads of money. This is not a sustainable system, and this is not a system that can possibly deliver any kind of justice. You know what this reminds me of? Um, well, I think, I can't remember what the name of the book is. There's a book that came out earlier this year. It was called something like How Democracies Die by two academics in the US, and they had looked at Venezuela and other countries where basically you would have a strongman leader and how they dismantle the institutions mm -hmm. and the belief in the institutions. Mm -hmm. And, you know, ultimately, in name, it's a democracy but none of those institutions function in the way that they were intended to. Yeah. So you could say Trump is doing that, but I mean, you could quite easily make a case to say what's been going on since 2010 and possibly before that, you know, just total dismantling of... Uh, Absolutely. I look at the... And, uh, sorry. And just to say that the techniques are not the uh, incredible crashes and bangs that we imagine that we associate with scandal, right? This is a bureaucratic, slow, long arduous journey for these people who are now being on technicalities excluded from the justice that they are entitled to okay and there's people and there's the system there's mm. institutions as well because that's mm. how they do it isn't it you kind of just make these small changes in the institutional psychology yeah any more on legal um i think that is it for now all i can say is do try and support uh the cause because it's difficult for 
these lawyers to really get a big campaign behind them. And they've been talking about this for a long time. Got any names of any institutions or any kind of organisations or anything like that? Uh, I think there's one called Save Legal Aid. I think that's the name of it. Um, But there'll be loads of... There's a report to this today in The Guardian by Gabby Hinsliff, who's talking about this. And there's a strike that's ongoing that's been going on for a, for a little while. Okay, so maybe we can try and include some links in whatever we put up. Yeah. All right, well, there's lots of different ways of going on to the next parts of the show. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, I'll start off with a few bullet points and let's see where we go. I noticed from looking at the papers today, I take great pleasure in looking at the editorial of The Sun and The Daily Mail uh, <laughs> as frequently as I can. And the main issues that I could see on Monday, Tuesday were customs union, housing, which I could see was a way of talking about what they called intergenerational inequality, toxic taxes and press regulation. So we could talk about any or all of those things, and I hope we do manage to. But of course, there's a lot of detail that comes off the back of these, because whatever they say is the story, then also there's that secondary game. So I think we'll leave Customs Union for a bit. The housing thing, right. So in the FT on Monday, they talked about a report from the TUC which said that there'd be a million more people in child poverty in 2018 than in 2010. Mm -hmm. So in just under a decade, a million extra. And at the end of the report by Chris Giles, the FT's economics person, the last three or four paragraphs of this tiny report, they said... Of course, this is just before the Intergenerational Commission report that comes out tomorrow that will talk about how young people can get on the housing ladder. And what was interesting for me was as I play my game of informational arbitrage, I look at all of the newspapers, I look at the FT, I look at the Morning Star and the Sun and the Mail and all this kind of thing. The Morning Star was the only other paper to mention the TUC report. Right. And they said the headline was to do with child poverty but above the headline they have this kind of category that it belongs to and in the morning star it belonged in the austerity category the mm-hmm. tuc report about child poverty and in the ft the category was intergenerational inequality and i thought look this is where it goes this is about austerity this is about child poverty and they ended up talking about how people can't get on the housing ladder <laughs> there's a there's a there's a household where the children's parents are working and are on benefits because they're not earning enough money and they're actually living in child poverty. And they were finding a way of spinning it into an intergenerational inequality sort of promotional article. The next day when they, when they released the report, they said in the FT piece, which was praising the report, they said, oh, by the way, Sarah O'Connor, an FT employment journalist was on the commission. So I thought, right, okay. So the Intergenerational... Inequality Commission. Yeah, which is run by the Resolution Foundation. So the Intergenerational Commission report by the Resolution Foundation had a recommendation, which was (laughs) that when you turn 25, you need to be given £10,000 to help you recover from all of the difficulties that you face from basically... All of Being the, worse off than the previous generation. Yeah, they were saying all of that. And I got the report. I went down there. That was quite funny. Went down to the <laughs> Resolution Foundation. And I said, yeah, give me the physical copy of the report. And when I went in there, there was Russian Soviet uh, paintings inside the reception areas, at least two of them. And I remember looking at the big screen and it was actually Prime Minister's Question Time. And, you know, they were just about to discuss things like press regulation and stuff like that. So I thought it was really funny seeing all this Russian communist iconography. It made me think of controlled opposition, mm. and especially with Resolution Foundation being a sort of supposedly cross-party think tank with David Willits and um, Torsten Bell, who used to be Ed Miliband's advisor. Anyway, they're talking about intergen- intergenerational inequality. And at the same time, very few people ended up talking about this child poverty story from the TUC. Right. And that night, on Monday night, I didn't watch it, but dispatches, the Child Poverty Action Group contributed to a program on universal credit. And it wasn't discussed in the press at all. I I don't know if it was, it may even be a case of the better the film was, the less it got discussed in the press. I don't know, I haven't seen it. I did call the Child Poverty Action Group the next day and said, how did you feel about it? Because my experiences with dispatches haven't been good at all. You know, I think they mangle stuff. Hmm. Um, I now realise that I had a really good experience with dispatches because... <laughs> Compared I mean, to this. Well, I mean, I don't know how good the programme was, but it never got discussed. Um, I also noticed that 
the word child and poverty are not put next to each other in the press. Now, I think there might even be a deal um, because the FT would say children who experience poverty or something like that. They wouldn't say child poverty. Really? Yeah. And you told me and other people have reminded me that in July 2015, Ian Duncan Smith uh, re-attempted to change the definition of child poverty from 60% of the median income to taking into account things like drug use and education and stuff like that. So whatever that formula is, I don't know if they use it, but I think that was another case of change the definition. Mm. And there was this thing called the Social Mobility Commission, which had Alan Milburn, a new Labour guy, on it. And they changed the name from, sorry, it was the Social Mobility and Child Poverty Commission, and they changed its name to Social Mobility Commission. And Has then that been changed now? Yeah, they changed its name, and I think now it's defunct because mm. he quit. And I think they still release things maybe, but it's December 2017, he quit. He basically said, with Brexit, there's obviously no political will to look at this. Incredible. Yeah. Incredible. And, and at the same this time... This is at the same time as, as you say, child poverty is going up and social mobility has come to a halt in this country. And also, it's at the same time that the likes of Rhys Mogg will refer to being able to pay for your children's clothing and footwear. You know, that's his, but that's what he sells as the benefit of Brexit. And I'm sure there are, you know, different, you know, views possible on Brexit. But interesting that whilst they're taking that particular sales approach to Brexit, Mm -hmm. at the same time, they're saying, but, you know, let's forget about child poverty. So child poverty is ignored. Um, And so that's one report that came out. Mm. But then the thing that got all the headlines was the intergenerational thing. And the guy behind that is David Willits, who's now Lord Willits, also known as Two Brain Willits. Now, Willits is the man who brought in the, he tripled the university fees in 2010. Or, right, uh, to 9,000 a year. From 3,000, which led to the smashing up of Piccadilly and Oxford Street <laughs> and lots of people going to jail. I mean, I wasn't in England at the time, but I remember looking at the front pages of newspapers and things like that, and it did look as though things were going off. Mm. Um, and some people that we know have said that they wouldn't have formed the media, you know, the you know the alt-left media co- <laughs> you know, companies that we, you know, are, that we know. Uh, they, they would never have formed if it weren't for what Willits did in terms of... That tri- radicalised them. Yeah, that he radicalised them. On top of all of that, in 1993 and before that, he was apparently, I think on his Wikipedia page, Paul Foote um, from Private Eye said back then that he was the brains behind the PFI. So it's funny that Alan Milburn, who was also known as the Poverty Czar when he was doing social mobility, in 97 he was responsible for putting PFI into the hospitals for new labour. And then works for, I think it's PwC, the big audit firm that also does um, PFI and things like that. So that guy became the poverty czar. And David Willits is now, he's you know, inter- anointed himself the intergenerational czar. But I think that is really just targeting swing voters. So instead of talking about austerity, mm. they wanted to say, are you a potential Tory voter? Would you normally vote Tory, but you're thinking that you can't do that because capitalism is broken? And the bank of mum and dad isn't helping you out enough. So maybe this is what it takes. And I think this is really going to what Nick Timothy, um, Theresa May's former chief of staff, is what his really view is. We've got to get the white working class on side. And you're not going to do that unless you help everyone. And actually, that is applaudable. But the way in which you do it has to also fit in with your other economic policies. Mm -hmm. And if your economic policies are unsustainable for the poor, then how are you going to accelerate history and find a way of bringing that sort of social justice? And it's going to have to be by something like this, they think. But it's just cosmetic, isn't it? Exactly. 18 grand for universities and 10 for... Any of those problems with child poverty. It doesn't deal with the fact that the housing, uh, the property... Bubble. Bubble is out of control. Although it must be said that right now, this is interesting... Halifax recently reported figures that said that house prices have dropped by 3% recently. And so then you kind of think, ah, are we praising deflation? This is what happened with Brexit. When the pound went down, everyone said, oh, it was due for a correction. It was overvalued (laughs) anyway. So, you know, where do you stand? But yeah, carry on, sorry. But clearly the Conservative government doesn't want to deal with the housing bubble. You know, help to buy have, have all been ways of maintaining it, but allowing people to take on more debt to get onto the ladder. And of course, having a house, owning a house is always, I spoke to Laurie McFarlane, who is now Open Democracy, and he's written a book um, about land economics, really, really good. And he said the idea of owning a house was a real way of the Conservatives winning over Labour voters 
uh, and more left-wing voters because of the, uh, the property, the idea of owning property was so important. So they've kind of in this bind whereby they want people to own property so they can become conservatives because that's the surest fire way of doing it. But then they also need to maintain this ridiculous housing bubble and they don't want to deal with the actual causes of that. So this £10,000 then comes out. Sure. And in terms of Lou, in the same way that fox hunting was also viewed as class war in, by, by many, by, by New Labour, um, also you have this, which is intergenerational. So I think Age UK, the head of Age UK wrote a letter to the Times saying there's more poverty, there's more intra intra generational poverty than intergenerational poverty as in in any one generation um the whole class structure means that the problem is actually to do with who's rich and who's poor of that age mm. you know of that generation than it is between the generations um so that's another kind of distraction and yeah very interesting to see these loops come up where how do they get out of jail how do they get themselves back in fashion in whatever way they can um yeah i'm not sure where i'm going with that but um, so you don't. What do you? What's your thoughts on it? What's your thoughts? Well, Akala was really, really good on the um, on the question time yesterday. He said something that I saw in some of the business papers as well, which was why not give people a ten thousand pound interest free loan if they want it to be able to start their own businesses? Because right now you can get a loan to go to university. Um, but what about getting a loan to start your own business? And then that's surely giving people a chance to employ people eventually and make some money and things like that, mm. which is a good thing, right? And, um, yeah, for some reason, yeah, it's interesting. Surely in line with the Conservatives. Well, estimate, Esther McVeigh, who sat next to him, and obviously it's her job to just um, do sound bites. she made it sound as though they were already doing that. I mean, it would be really good to fact check that because I think what she's talking about, I remember going into the job centre about five or six years ago, and I can't remember what thing that she mentioned, but they mentioned that. And it really didn't sound very helpful. Mm. And whatever it was, it's only helpful if you are, you know, if you think that you're able to live off £70 a week in the first place. Sure. Um, oh, by the way, in terms of the changing of the definitions of uh, child poverty, in the Daily Mail, they had a story talking about how IDS was completely vindicated because there are less <laughs> people claiming... Um, I think some types of unemployment benefit than before. Mm. But, you know, who knows how many of them died? I mean, really, I don't know. You know, people die every day. Mm. And who knows what from? Also, when they drop off the figures, again, who it's, knows why? it's just a figures game, right? So they, there's going to be lots of people who don't want to come into the job center because it's such a humiliating thing. So they just fall off the system altogether. Now, when they brought in policies like workfare, which was. Uh, essentially they brought in these rules whereby you have to take on this work experience. This work experience seems to be stacking... Working for free at Tesco's, right? Yeah, yeah, stacking shelves in Tesco, which you never needed to have experience for before, right? Um, the government's own reports showed that workfare never worked and its effects were pushing down wages and, you know, benefiting the organizations who get free work. And in the US, they've had similar kinds of systems. And what it's done there is pushed people off the system. So you just have people in a no man's land where they don't want to come forward because the whole process is is humiliating. And, you know, there's lots of more surveillance and, you know, people going, are you looking for work enough? These kinds of barriers that they can never quite reach that are very vague. Yeah. And I think marrying these things off, as I said, I saw this child poverty story, TUC report, and then the FT made it sound as though it was about intergenerational inequality. And then they say, let's give everyone 10 grand when they hit 25 as a way of getting young people to vote for them and to try and think like they're um, capitalists in some way. But um, the other thing is that it's class war when you do fox hunting. But when you do this, it's intergenerational. So it's make the young hate the rich. So it's almost like a kind of cultural revolution. Mm -hmm. You know, saying, oh, you lot did this to us. So, you know, it's compensation. So take from one, give to the other. And then they're saying that when you're over 65, the national insurance that you would have normally paid, you would have normally paid less than people who are younger than you because you're 65. And so now what they're saying is, and this is a recommendation from the Intergenerational Commission, is that when you hit 65, if you're still working, then you should pay um, the same as everyone else because you you shouldn't have had that rebate. And so I think what they're trying to do is making recommendations 
that all of the things that were happening to benefit old people, they want to take them all away. Right. And it's interesting because economics correspondents, I remember once I was with the BBC economics correspondent, uh, who shall remain nameless on this occasion, and he said to us, oh, pensioners, the way in which pensioners have been treated, you know, it's unfair. They've been given all of these benefits by the government. And, you know, it's because they all vote Tory, blah, 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 blah. And when he went off, you know, after talking to us, another journalist said to me, why doesn't he ever say that when he's on the BBC? You know, he is a BBC economics correspondent and he never says that on the telly. Interesting. So now it looks like Willits is arranging the attack on the old and he's arranging the attack on the old just as I become old. <laughs> um, and so all of these people, you know, when he says we're going to give you 10 grand, mm. you know, but what happens when they hit 65? And so there's just a range of reliefs that they were entitled to that are all being taken away now. Um, and in a way, it's a bit like that thing where you can't please everyone. So politics is all about learning how to not please people in exactly the right way um, so that you get away with it. Yeah. Okay, um, so that's the housing thing. What else did we say we were going to talk about? There was press and... Press regulation. Yeah, um, we'll part of that for a second. There was toxic taxes. I saw this in The Sun and they were basically saying that a tax on diesel is a toxic tax because motorists have um, been hurt enough. So this is playing from the, the persecution of the motorist sort of thing. You know, these motorists, they thought they were being environmentally friendly when they bought this diesel under new labor. Now they're being told they're going to be taxed more. Um, and so instead of saying that the diesel is toxic, they're saying that the tax is toxic. And this is the sun who hold adverts for cars. So it's interesting to see. It's the, cost the industry. Yeah. So it's interesting to see the car lobby managing to get through to the sun's editorial in that way. That made me think of AGMs. So it's the middle of May. And it's AGM season, which is the annual general meeting when shareholders got to talk to the people who run their public companies like BP. And in the business press, all they're saying is shareholder revolt, shareholder revolt. So it was Karl Marx's 200th birthday a couple of days ago or last week. And if you looked at the mail on Sunday, etc., it would say, oh, shareholder revolt. And they publish a table with all of these different CEOs that are being overpaid. And they're making it sound as though there's a big revolt over this sort of thing. Mm. And in honesty, there are for some, but not for all. And what they never mention is the BAE systems or the BP, where there are also people going in there who are saying, we don't like what you're doing to our air. You're do we don't like what you're doing to our environment. We don't like what you're doing to children in Yemen. Yeah. You know, you're bombing and polluting all over the place. They never Keep it all about... They're getting paid too much. That's what the issue is. Yeah, we hate bankers because of this, that, and the other. And yeah. they never talk about the actual the actual issues that are going on alongside that. Mm. Um, I saw a, an interview with Chris Hedges recently, and he was talking about how the media essentially protects the powerful, and the powerful people right now in society are corporations. And he said, you know, you never see big investigations or consistent reporting on companies like BP. And yet they are responsible for huge amounts of environmental collapse. And, you know, that's where the big story is right now. But we don't see any of that because they're not talked about. It's interesting. Yeah, because we talked about BP, didn't we, the other day? And in terms of what they were doing with uh, about Cambridge, trying to divest from them. Mm -hmm. There was also Barclays and the way in which there was a whistleblower who Jess Staley, the head of Barclays, tried to unmask. And he was fined a million pounds, but he was told that there's your integrity remains intact. You know, all of this kind of stuff. Press regulation. What about that? What did, what, where, I mean, obviously we don't, I ha, I've got to admit, I haven't done enough research into it. Mm. I know, we've, we know people who are for it and against it. So, yeah, what was interesting for me was, was seeing the Daily Mail and the Sun and how strongly they came out against it. And they were trying to find ways of... So there was a, a vote on installing Leveson 2, which was the second part of Leveson, which I think deals with the criminal aspects of, I think, this yeah. Is to do with, this is the fallout from phone hacking, right? 2011. Exactly, the phone hacking scandal, uncovered by The Guardian uh, and Nick Davies. And this was to implement what has come as a result of the Leveson inquiry. So these suggestions that the press should be regulated more through... A independent but connected to the state regulator. Mm. And of course, it's it's interesting because obviously a lot of the press has come out against it. 
and they're saving their own hides. <laughs> well, as Clea Bourne says, and by the way, may I again recommend anybody to watch her video in her book, she says the first rule of PR is to protect PR, you know, is to, is to sell the idea of having trust strategists and mm. saying, right, you know, you need to have a PR person. So in the same way, the press, they need to start talking about press freedom even though we know there's loads of stuff that they never talk about in the press. Of course. And they say, oh, we've got to protect investigative journalism. But as you just said, from Chris Hedges and other people, they said, well, where is the investigative yeah. journalism exactly? And there's been these articles coming out saying, oh, you know, the press has learned their lesson and now they're, you know, they, they're important to our society and they're fiercely attacking uh, the powerful. And I'm like, am I in the... Am I in the wrong country? Because that's not what I see Which happening. Which powerful are they attacking? You know, there's no they attack honesty. The house, they attacked the House of Lords this week. Because, oh, of yeah, course, yeah, in terms of customs union and everything like that, it's interesting to see the kind of fault lines in this country in terms of uh, customs union and press regulation. So the Tories in general have said, we want to stay out of the customs union and we are against press regulation. So Matt Hancock, the culture secretary, everybody gave him a big pat on the back, you know, the big media people saying, well done for looking after us, um, for stopping regulation. And then when in the House of Lords, there was a vote on the customs union saying we should stay in, then people just said, let's get rid of the Lords. You know, the, the Daily Mail front page said, let's get rid of the Lords. Mm. And so this is, again, you know, the whole thing of dismantling institutions. I mean, I know plenty of people and who, when want, who someone, want to get rid of the Lords. When anyway. someone becomes unuseful to you so previously you've got a lot a lot of tory mps who previously voted against reform of the house of lords who are now coming out against it because they're not following what they'd like to do mm. the other thing that's interesting is there was a vote i think yesterday or something like that or maybe not a vote i think that's the whole point theresa may knows that sajid javed for example is he's against the customs union Gavin Williamson, who's the defense secretary, during the week they were saying he's wobbling and that he's going to come out for the customs union. And the papers were putting lots of pressure on him. So now I think he's switched. So Theresa May now knows that if it goes to the Commons, the House of Commons is basically going to say uh, that they want to stay in the customs union and she's worried that she's going to lose. So she's delaying the vote, which is again evidence that cowardice and shamelessness is what gets you ahead yeah. in terms of if you want to win. It's all about maintaining that power. Yeah, and you sent me something about Tencent. I did. What was that? Because I think we're running out of time, so let's just get this one in. Okay. Um, so Tencent, the Chinese data giant, I think the second biggest in, in China, has struck a deal with a cultural deal. A uh, cultural revolution <laughs> on the 200th anniversary of Karl Marx. A cult yeah. Um, Liam Fox, our trade secretary, announced it on Wednesday. And it's to do with essentially what looks like a lot of content. So the BBC is involved. Um, in, and I'm not too sure on the details. You know, it's just been announced. But it essentially means that there's a deal going on between Tencent and a lot of UK broadcasters and streamers and content providers. It's like we've all got each other by the balls. I mean, this is ultra surveillance capitalism. We mentioned a few weeks ago that Alibaba had got onto ALEC, uh, the American Legislative Exchange Council, Sajid Javed and Michael Gove are going to Georgia for ultra deregulation talks. And we also mentioned that DeepMind had done, had done a deal with Babylon, who do online GP appointments in the UK, and that Babylon and DeepMind have got a deal with WeChat owned by Tencent, so that all of their medical inquiries in China, all the deep learning, all of those requests will be sent to Babylon over here. So in terms of cultural deals, that is, the Chinese medical data will come over here for us to have a look at in terms of our corporates linked in with Google. Mm. And now we're doing this. So it does make me think that Cameron and Chadlington are involved in this. Yeah, same um, here. Because of their UK China fund. And yeah, amazing. One last thing, in the American Banker, I saw a few stories about, it says here, lessons from a mobile payments revolution. There is no disputing that China is ahead of the rest of the world in mobile payments what insight does it offer U.S. bankers? So again, that means China are world leaders in surveillance capitalism and banking, and we're just going to copy them. Yeah. Cam, anything else? On the subject of surveillance capitalism, the vote happened this week on the data protection bill, which we talked about recently, uh, which calls for open season on migrants in terms of how they use their data and how they're able to track them. There was one small win, which meant that the NHS was to stop sharing information on immigrants. However, the data protection bill was still voted through 
And it means that all of the other problems with it, and as we said before, it's likely to cause a second Windrush scandal because it's all to do with their documentation. It's all to do with mistreatment and no transparency with how these migration claims are being held, uh, dealt with. So yeah, unfortunately, that has, that has gone through. Okay, that's something for us to help people shine a light on in the future. Mm -hmm. All right, well, thanks a lot, Cam, and thanks for listening. Bye.